Uh, so yeah, thanks very much. Thanks for uh, inviting me here. Um, I'm very happy to have this talk. Um, and uh, maybe before I start with the actual content, just a bit uh, about where I come from. So um, actually I come from, a, I'm heading a group uh, at our university, which is uh, called Lab for Computer Graphics and Multimedia. Um, and uh, we have been working with MIR, let's say music information retrieval, for quite some time now, I think from, it will be, I, I don't want to count actually. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, and we have been doing different things with um, music, different styles of music and so on, uh, from sort of transcription of piano music and melody extraction and all these kinds of things, segmentation, mood related things, for quite a long time. Um, and we are also currently having several um, research directions, but um, from uh, also maybe the last 10 years, uh, we have been working together with uh, our Institute of Ethnomusicology in, in Slovenia, in Ljubljana, um, and working with their collections and their materials, uh, applying music information retrieval also to the folk music data. Uh, and so this is actually the topic of my talk here, and I would like to present to you uh, some of the things that we did, um, some of the results that we got, um, and of course I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might be having. So um, before uh, maybe we, I start with the actual topics, uh, if we talk about folk music of, of Slovenia, and this is what the, our National Institute of Ethnomusicology has been gathering, uh, maybe it would be good to hear uh, what it sounds like. So uh, uh, I will play a short clip so that you maybe get a feeling of what types of things are, are in this archive. Uh, <laughs> sort of a cross-section of uh, the different types of materials that you find uh, in the archive. Um, so Slovenia is sort of between different uh, cultures and also this reflects in the folk music. So there are lots of different influences and different styles of music that we have. Um, and uh, it's quite a challenging collection to, to work with, of course, from the, let's say, music analysis point of view. Um, to, to maybe outline a bit more uh, what uh, the collection is about that we're working with. So it's a uh, collection of the Institute of Ethnomusicology. There are sort of folk song manuscripts uh, with sort of transcriptions uh, dating from the beginning of the 20th century on. And then there are lots of audio recordings, of course, from the oldest on wax cylinders and then from the 50s on, lots of tapes and then, of course, nowadays digital um, recordings. Uh, also visual documentation, of course, and some videos of dances. And, uh, of course, basic metadata for parts of these items, but of course there is this problem that all the archives are having. Uh, there isn't enough metadata that you want to search on more criteria, on more things, and uh, this is actually was our uh, um, sort of uh, uh, our challenge to actually extract information from this collection, of course, as automatically as we want. Of course, information which will be useful either for analysis, so by musicologists and other types of, of, of people who are working with this data, or uh, for searching also for general public, for everybody to find things that they are interested in. Uh, and of course, the challenge that comes with it is uh, 
uh, if you want to make uh, information from such an archive available, you need to build some user interfaces, uh, preferably that cater to different user groups. And this is also something that we have been uh, uh, working on uh, and I will shortly present here. Okay, so uh, actually we have been working with the archive for like, let's say the last 10 years. Um, and in the beginning, uh, sort of around 2006, um, they uh, have been digitizing the, their collection very quickly, but they were lacking any kinds of tools to, to actually organize their metadata and uh, all, all these kinds of things. So um, this was our first project, very, uh, let's say, application-like project where we actually build them tools for, let's say, content and metadata management um, that they are still using now to, to sort of store the metadata. And we built some sort of a web interface for presentation, which is by today's standards already out of date and so forth, but uh, let's say 10 years ago it was uh, still quite okay. Uh, and uh, from that time on, uh, of course, our challenge was to apply uh, using information retrieval to, to the archive um, to try to extract some useful information out of it. And uh, I'll be talking about some things that actually have been mentioned here several times today already, but uh, I would like to show our take on, on, on what we did here. Um, so uh, when we are talking about audio recordings, I will be briefly describing what we did with segmentation. We have just heard before uh, uh, the segmentation of the archive. We also did our own segmentation tools and uh, um, things. Also transcription, um, I will be mentioning a bit. Um, I will also show you what we did with, uh, let's say, more symbolic scores, so with transcriptions. Um, and in the end, I will try to outline the user interfaces that we built. Uh, so okay, let's start. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, the audio, of course, uh, audio is maybe the largest part of, of the archive. Um, and of course, in the music information retrieval community, if I say like that, uh, of course, the, the research has been going on for a long time. Uh, uh, well, people do techniques to extract things from audio, melody or rhythm or, you know, doing transcriptions or trying to find which notes are, are in the audio and so forth. But uh, when you work with real folk music recordings, so the recordings like we have, which were done in the field with amateur musicians and so forth, um, these techniques usually are not very successful because there are many challenges that these kinds of uh, um, recordings have that are not present in, let's say, studio recordings or, you know, uh, commercial music. Um, and of course, this is one thing that you need to face uh, when you build these techniques. And um, just to give you some examples, of course, one side are the performers who are not professionals. So, so they, may, they may not be very accurate when they sing, uh, if I can say so. Or, you know, you can um, have uh, issues when people... And then they forget, and you know, then they continue and so forth. So it's, uh, oops, sorry. Um, so these kinds of things on the performer side, and I will mention a few later on, and of course the recordings are also far from ideal. I mean, they are usually field recordings made in the fields, so there's lots of noise. All the recordings uh, have, of course, the equipment which is far from ideal, and uh, of course the settings are not uh, good, and there can be live, like, whatever they do and of course when you when you try to do music information retrieval on this kinds of material then you need to take sort of these things into consideration otherwise the results will not be uh, as nice as you would have wanted them to be um, so basically the most approaches I would say that people do on, on popular or on commercial music are not really suitable for direct application to, to, to folk music you need to adapt them or you know, take care of, of, of uh, the specifics. Um, and okay, so uh, where I will start with what we did, I will outline some things that I said before. The first one is uh, uh, segmentation. Of course, uh, we have already heard before about segmentation of radio, uh, radio broadcasts, uh, and we have a sort of a similar problem here. So uh, what is, has been recording uh, in, in uh, this archive are field recordings. So field recordings mean that everything that happens in the field when, uh, you know, the mus musicologists go out, um, they record everything, so there is speech, there is singing, there is instrumental, there is pauses, there is noises, there is everything in, in this uh, long, let's say, recordings. And 
Of course, if you want to automatically analyze those, you need, to, you need a way to segment this uh, into different uh, units, and you can say, okay, so this is speech, and then I might, you might apply some techniques for to speech, or you can say this is solo singing. So um, our goal was, of course, to automatically segment these recordings, um, and of course, not just provide segment, but of course, to also classify. And we went, uh, we first tried some standard approaches that are usually applied to radio broadcasts, but they didn't really work. Uh, so we said, okay, we need to do something else. Um, and we also expanded the, the, let's say, the definition of, of what we want to do. So we didn't really want to do just music versus speech, but we said, okay, we might have more classes because lots of materials in the archives actually fall into five, uh, five different classes. So one is speech, of course, when uh, the musicologists usually are talking to, to the people uh, who are performing. And then there's lots of solo singing, so uh, individual singing. Um, there, are, there is lots of what I would say choir singing, but this means two or more voices in, in, in this example. Um, and of course, there are lots of instrumentals, which we say that any recordings that have instrumental background are sort of instrumental. And then there is this specific category that you heard at the end, uh, at the beginning, which is called bell chiming, which is sort of a tradition of playing, uh, let's say, rhythmic patterns on church bells, uh, which is also, let's say, there is quite some of it in the archive. So we said, okay, well, let's make these five classes, and these will be the ones that we will try to segment into uh, our recordings. Um, and so um, we made this uh, machine learning approach where we classify sort of short bits of audio um, into these five classes. Actually, for each short bit, we get a distribution over these five classes. So let's say this is 70% speech and maybe 70% singing. So this will be something between speech and singing um, and so forth. And then we can actually produce uh, the segments. So set some boundaries which say uh, this part is just speech and this part is just um, choir. Uh, and I will actually demonstrate how this worked for you because we also um, built a tool uh, that is also freely available uh, for anybody to use uh, to do segmentation. Um, we call it Sapphire, which would be segmentation of field recordings. Um, and uh, it's uh, something, it's a tool that looks like this. I will try to demonstrate just uh, how it looks. So. Uh, Sort of a very basic interface, you can open, uh, let's say, a field recording, and I will open, for example, this one. Uh, and then when it opens, it actually calculates, uh, not the segment itself yet, but it actually calculates for each short part of, of a song, uh, which class it belongs to, and we color coded this thing. So what you see here in, uh, let's say, in green, or this sort of yellow green, uh, should be, you can't really read this very well on this projector, but uh, are choirs or two or more voices singing. So what you see in sort of dark blue uh, should be speech. If the blue is a bit lighter, it should be sort of solo singing. I don't see much of it here. And the orange, for example, is instrumental. So this is, this is the way you sort of feel uh, what's, what's in it, and we can go and, and see if it's true. Okay. okay, so this is something where more people are singing, and here, Probably So you can get uh, sort of a uh, So it's uh, you can get a, a, an overview of this is a two-hour uh, uh, audio file um, And you can get an overview of what's in it. Uh, of course, you can zoom in and then look at these things uh, uh, and of course you can also do the segmentation, so you can say segment and then it places uh, the boundaries between what it uh, deems to be individual segments and of course you can move these boundaries or set your own boundaries and so forth. So this is uh, a sort of a tool that assists you with, with uh, segmentation. It can also produce, of course, automatically the segments uh, to be analyzed further um, and it's sort of a basic baseline that, that we use or basic tool that we use when we, when we work with a field recording. Um, as I said, uh, we made this, uh, this is actually part of the tools that are uh, used by, in the institute, they're integrated into their, their sort of metadata management, but we also made a sort of separate tool which is available online, um, and it, the, the one that I showed before. Uh, what we can also do when we have these kinds of distributions of, of let's say, materials in a recording available is we can actually uh, sort of make this sort of a color-coded summarizations of, of of uh, individual audio files. So if this, is, uh, this box is one uh, field recording, which is an hour long, you can 
uh, quickly see that it's mostly instrumental and a bit of speech. Or for this one, you can see that it's mostly speech and a bit of solo singing. So it's, it's a sort of a fast preview when you work with these things that you can actually see uh, faster what, it's, what the content is, is like. Um, uh, we actually, uh, uh, okay, this was trained and, and, and made, uh, let's say, specifically for this collection of, of the Institute, but we actually tried it to other uh, materials. Uh, there is a sort of evaluation of these kinds of um, music speech algorithms uh, also in the Myrex, which is a sort of music information retrieval um, evaluation uh, campaign. And actually, we had the best algorithm in 215, so this was the best one also for recordings, I think, from the British Library Archive. So it's, uh, it works for other types of music, like African and so forth, also to an extent. Okay, it's not perfect anyway, but uh, um, it works to an extent. Um, and currently we are enhancing it and making new classifier. We heard of deep learning before, and this is what we are currently doing with this. Um, okay, so this is uh, segmentation. And uh, of course, when we, when we then know uh, what material are we dealing with, for example, is it solo singing, is it choir singing, and so forth. Our next target, of course, was transcription. So why transcription? So first, let's define transcription in this context. I mean, usually for music information retrieval, transcription means uh, let's try to find notes in an audio recording. Yeah? So uh, meaning pitch and onset time and duration. So you are not talking about, let's say, graphical transcription and putting notes in a sort of a sheet music uh, format, but you're just trying to find a list of pitches and when they start and when they end. And, uh, this is what you want to do. Of course, this is a sort of a logical step if you want to enable things like searching by uh, score or by melody, uh, which is something that you would probably like to do in a collection like this. Um, uh, and of course, transcription in, in general is a very difficult problem. Uh, because uh, it is difficult for humans, of course, it's time consuming and needs expert, and it is also difficult for machines because it's uh, uh, questionable if, in, in general case, it's actually solvable. But uh, even the best algorithms nowadays, still their accuracy, if I looked at the Myrex, the last Myrex evaluation, they, it's around 50%. So it will sort of get 50% right and it will put a lot of extra notes inside or miss a lot of the ones. So it's, even the best algorithms are not very good if, we look like, if it look like that. But, um, of course, even an imperfect transcription can be useful if you use it for searching or for retrieval. So that's, that's, that's the upside of it. Uh, and of course, um, if you focus on a specific domain, then maybe you can make better algorithms. So our goal here for transcription, we actually had two different types of things that we did. Uh, one was for uh, folk singing, so for, not for solo, because this is mostly solved. Uh, if you have just one person singing, you can transcribe it quite accurately. But uh, for, let's say, more than one voice. So this is what we call choir here, so more than one voice. Um, and uh, it's actually quite a challenging task. Um, and also, if you look at most existing transcription algorithms that people work on, they don't aim for this type of music. They aim for instrumental music, and if you apply them, you won't really be very good anyway. Um, so what we did, we said, okay, um, but if we work with folk singing, then we have one advantage over, let's say, a general transcription algorithm, and this is that folk singing usually is quite repetitive. So you have stanzas which have some content and they usually repeat, at least in Slovenian uh, folk singing. Uh, of course, these repetitions, so the structure is simple and everything is repeated. Of course, these repetitions might not be, uh, uh, oops, oh, this is not good. Uh, so these repetitions, uh, so it keeps repeating, but what you get a lot, lot many times is, of course, that the performers, uh, they will change their pitch over time, of course, and they will 
uh, maybe get higher and higher or they will get lower and lower. Of course, the, the repetitions won't be perfect. There will be different types of um, mistakes or, or just uh, inaccurate singing anyway uh, that they make. Um, so, but uh, the structure is repetitive. So with our approach to, to transcription, we actually try to make use of these repetitions um, and just to briefly outline what we did, not in, not in any details, it, uh, that we try to find actually the parts that repeat. Uh, for example, this is one stanza that repeats in this song many times, uh, but as you might observe, okay, it's not very relevant. Actually, the pitch gets higher and higher as, as uh, the performers are singing, but we try to actually estimate these repetitions and in the same time estimate how the pitch uh, actually drifts over time, so how the performer gets higher and higher in this particular particular recording. Uh, and from that on, actually, what we uh, try to estimate is from all the repetition, we try all the repetitions we try to est get a single transcription of one stanza, so that you can actually have a, a transcription algorithm which will make many mistakes over the whole song, maybe. But when you group all them together, then again, maybe you get something better. As we've seen before with speech, you take Google's translation and Microsoft's translation and put them together and it's better. So here it's sort of the same, the same logic. Um, and uh, so if we just uh, look at some of the results, or yeah, maybe I can uh, show you uh, an original recording, maybe this one. It's not that difficult, but... <laughs> So forth, uh, and uh, if we apply just a, a generic transcription algorithm to this, so we didn't develop it; it was uh, from another group. They developed it. It works fairly well for general music, but if we transcribe this type of recording with this algorithm, okay, uh, and I will use the piano timbre to to resynthesize the whole thing, uh, then what you will hear is not very good. So lots, lots of things going on because of the harmonic, because of the formants and so forth. And uh, usually these algorithms are already very tuned to, 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 to these kinds of, uh, let's say, singing. Uh, but if we just apply our approach and take this same algorithm, but we just merge all the repetitions into one to try to get a sort of a better sounding one stanza, then we are a bit better. Yeah? So let's hear. <laughs> not perfect, far from it, but uh, it improves in a way. Um, these results are currently still far from, of course, what we would uh, like to have. And uh, it, they could, in a way, be already maybe useful for retrieval, although we don't use it as far in, in any kind of uh, production environment. But we are working towards improving the, the, the transcriptions. Um, on a side note, okay, we are also making a tool for transcription, but maybe I will leave it because it's not very far yet. Um, we have also done some transcriptions, but I will be very brief here because um, um, of bell chiming. So this is the, the church bell playing traditions. Um, so we had some quite good results there, actually better than for, for singing. Uh, so I can maybe play you a... Uh, 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 an original. Okay. Okay. And then I cannot stop it. And then I play the transcription. actually was quite good, it sort of was around 90% correct depending on the number of bells. So this kind of constraint, uh, let's say, uh, 
um, recordings can be transcribed quite good. So this can be useful already for pattern analysis or for sort of a analysis of a corpus of these kinds of, of material. Which, and they actually were also used by, by um, a similar approach uh, in the Netherlands by the Mertens Institute to, to analyze their bell playing clocks. So we had this algorithm applied to, to a different domain. It sort of works. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so this is a part about the audio. So I, I presented segmentation and transcription. Uh, I would like also to, see, to, to, to tell you something what we did uh, with materials which are not audio, so which are scores. <laughs> Uh, so sheet music, if I say so, uh, and of course scores in this uh, archive, they come from usually uh, old manuscripts which are transcribed, which were, um, let's say, uh, uh, manually uh, written into the digital notation, um, and of course by transcriptions of audio recordings that usually musicologists make uh, by themselves. Um, and there is several, I don't know, tens of thousands of tunes in, in, in the collection, uh, which were uh, input uh, in actually Sibelius, which is a commercial uh, sort of software uh, that they use, but we converted this into music XML, so we have uh, this sort of a readable, machine readable notation uh, that we can then use. Um, and of course, uh, uh, why do we use scores? Uh, of course, scores are very nice to have when you want to search uh, uh, the collection uh, of via melody and so forth. Uh, and of course, this is uh, a very basic things that we did um, already very soon in the beginning. Uh, we don't use any fancy techniques. We use engrams. I think you have heard today, if I remember correctly, about what engrams are. So we just use uh, this kind of an engram approach to, to index uh, this collection of melodies and to um, actually uh, do the searching. Um, we have built this kind of searches into our web interfaces that we have uh, to this collection, uh, which I might... Uh, actually show you. So this is, uh, uh, you've seen before, a web interface to a collection of, of uh, uh, Norwegian uh, folk songs. So this is a web interface that's uh, for the collection of uh, Slovenian uh, part of the archive. So this is a small part, it's not the entire archive. Um, but it's basically, so this is in Slovenian, I think, so let's switch to, to, to English. Okay. Um, so uh, what you can do here is, of course, search uh, the archive in, in different ways. Uh, uh, of course, by, by typing uh, any kind of keywords. Uh, but uh, what you can also, of course, have is uh, you can search by melody. Uh, so this is a sort of a general generic interface. Uh, either you type in the melody or you sort of play it on, on this sort of piano type uh, uh, interface. So maybe I can... Um, I can type something, so for example. So this is how it looks like, and then of course I can do the search, and uh, I can find uh, our results. So this, the technique for, that we use here is uh, standard n-grams, so it's nothing very special. And we get this first uh, hit, which I think will be the first <laughs> Of course, we can look at the details and uh, see more of the metadata uh, and, of course, also the score uh, if we want to. So, um, sort of a, a basic uh, interface to the collection we can see on the map uh, where uh, the recording was made. So, this is sort of Slovenia. Uh, and, of course, we can explore this further on. Um, so, this is uh, one thing that we did with scores is, of course, very obvious is searching. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, we did another thing, which uh, sort of uh, was something that we thought would be, uh, at least for the, let's say, publicity uh, <laughs> sort of good, which is uh, query by humming. So uh, you want to hum or sing a melody and then uh, uh, try to retrieve, uh, depending on how well you sing and uh, how the algorithm is feeling today. Um, so it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can, uh, of course, uh, also, also try to demonstrate this, although I, I, I am not a good singer anyway. Um, but if I go here to sing, and I allow the microphone, uh, <clears throat> I can try something. Let's see if it works. Ah, la, 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 la. Okay, I sang something. Let's see if something comes up. Yeah, okay. Uh, 
the thing that I was singing is the fourth one, uh, I think. So this was the one that I searched before. But maybe the first and the second also have this somewhere in, inside. So uh, I don't think we, we, we want to really explore this. But uh, this is sort of a way that's, uh, let's say, more fun uh, uh, to use. But of course, these algorithms are still not that perfect, or even the singers are not that perfect. And if the collection is large uh, and the melodies are pretty similar, uh, then, of course, uh, it's uh, questionable whether the, th the song that you really thought you were searching for will be the one that will be in the first five or, you know, how many hits you want. Because, of course, one thing with folk music and with the retrieval of folk music is that there is lots of similarity between pieces. Uh, so, you know, a retrieval of any kind of a query usually will return many hits which will be very similar and uh, then it's, of course, you might want to find what is similar, but maybe for general public who have something in mind, uh, it will retrieve many things that they will think are not that relevant from my experience. Um, okay, um, so this is also based on score. So you're seeing it gets transcribed and then you make some sort of a best match. Uh, you, we use different techniques uh, for searching than of course the engrams, uh, which are adapted to query by humming, but I wouldn't go into details here. Um, and the last thing that I would uh, say that we do with um, the uh, scores um, is uh, try to discover patterns and similarities between uh, the tunes in the collection. Um, so finding what could be called melodic patterns or something like that. And we use uh, sort of our own architecture that we are developing at, at the university, which is a model which is called a uh, compositional hierarchical model. It's a more technical thing. Uh, it's a sort of a deep learning architecture and so forth, but I wouldn't go into details about that, but uh, maybe why we use it for, for example, one thing that we want to do is try to um, sort of group uh, tunes together into tune families. As uh, you might be aware of folk music, uh, of course, is, this type is composed of tunes, and of course, tunes are transmitted over generations. Uh, they are passed on. Uh, and of course, in the process, they get changed, they get mutated, uh, they get merged or split, or they fit to different lyrics and so forth. Um, and of course, they may man maintain some similarities. So there might be some common groups that you will say, this is one tune family, and this is another one, and this is a third one. Uh, and what we would like to do is um, actually uh, try to group melodies into these tune families automatically, if I say so. Uh, and we do this by actually using the, our model that we have uh, to find patterns, uh, to automatically find patterns, melodic patterns that are specific to different tune families. Um, and this is why you use this sort of a hierarchical uh, representation, which we learn from the corpus. Um, and um, this is a sort of a statistical approach to learning. So you have very short sort of melodic patterns, if I say so. Uh, in sort of lower layers, and then as you go up, you get more complex representation. And this is not just sort of a, an, an indexing scheme, it's a more flexible, uh, it can do things like hallucination and so forth, but let's leave it there. We use it to, to, for classification, and um, if I uh, give a, as an example, we tested it on, again on a Dutch corpus, uh, which had 360 songs in 26 uh, families, and. Um, we just made this experiment not long ago. We got some 70 and something percent, uh, which is not the best. I mean, people get much better scores uh, when they use uh, maybe more tuned techniques, but it's a good start, at least we think so. Um, so this is uh, our pattern discovery. And uh, finally, maybe just a few, no, a few, few more uh, things. Um, to conclude this, of course, during the, the course of our work with the Institute, we developed also some user interfaces. Uh, I have already shown you a bit of, of, of this one, which we sort of uh, use to, to expose the collection to the general public. Um, this is, there is actually quite a small part of the collection exposed here, only 200 recordings, again, due to copyright and different types of, of, of reasons. Um, but uh, we sort of try to make an, in, make an interface which is similar to, let's say, interfaces for popular music, uh, if we can say so. So what you can do here is besides, of course, searching for, um, of course, um, over, over all the metadata. Uh, and you can actually uh, browse by, by location. So this won't work very well here because we are in Norway. Uh, uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so no Slovenian folk music was recorded around here anyway. Uh, but yeah, 
uh, uh, if, we, if you are, of course, somewhere uh, in a location in Slovenia, so we can go down. Uh, so here we are, somewhere on the map, yeah, left. Uh, okay, we would be here, then we would get, of course, uh, songs uh, that are near the location where we are, and if you have this on a mobile device, then you can walk around and, of course, retrieve the things that are, that are near where you are. Uh, of course, the other modes of searching, as I said before, melody and singing, and we also have then these kinds of, uh, let's say, okay, there is a sort of a browsing by types, uh, but we also have these social features like uh, you can um, first have some favorite songs or you can share them over Facebook or Twitter and uh, make playlists, uh, share playlists and so forth. So this sort of type of things that people are used to in, let's say, more popular music providers. Um, and this is an interface that we built, I think, a year ago or maybe it was two already now. Um, it was quite well received. Uh, I hope also that the number of songs will be, will be uh, widened in time. Uh, but we also wanted to actually make, uh, or we are still wanting to make uh, an interface that will be useful also for different groups. So not just for general public, but also maybe for uh, researchers, uh, for performers or folklore groups, or for interested public, uh, uh, and maybe also for other public uh, in a different way. Um, we uh, didn't get uh, the funds yet to, to do anything regarding the implementation of this, but we did a design study uh, where we actually interviewed different uh, groups of people, what they would like to see in this kind of an interface, what they would like to do, how they would like to search, uh, what are they, their, their sort of wishes. Uh, and so we made this sort of, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, design of what we would like to have in the end. Uh, and um, it's sort of a combination of, uh, of course, uh, basic search, but for example, has these sort of specific features that you don't see uh, again on this projector, but uh, of, for example, grouping uh, uh, songs over tune families, so you could just see tune families and then you can expand all the variants uh, in each tune family. Uh, and of course, have different modalities for searching from melody to this kind of, uh, let's say, genre-based uh, things. Uh, and there was lots of uh, emphasis on geographic uh, search, so this is something that people thought was important. Uh, so trying to find things that are in the region, uh, all the songs, or uh, narrow the search down and so forth. And of course to expose all these different kinds of, uh, um, let's say, metadata and data about each recording, and uh, of course having this sort of social features like commenting and, and uh, liking and so forth. Um, yeah, and so this uh, concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mattia. Um, we do have time for some questions, and I, I may start myself. I, w I was just curious to hear about the... Um, I didn't really understand how much of the analysis that you're doing in this online thing that is based on symbolic representation and what is based on the signal. Or do you have both both uh, symbolic and signal-based representations for all of for all of your material. Uh, you mean here with, 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 when yeah. you come to search it? Mm. It's actually symbolic-based. Mm. So uh, for the for the audio-based, uh, so far we didn't really get uh, that far. So with the audio-based, for example, the transcription of bell chiming recording, this was sort of a separate project that we had that was used separately for then analysis of patterns and so forth, and it's not integrated here. So here, as far as query by humming goes and the techniques that are there, which are not really audio-based. Mm -hmm. So for uh, the uh, logical things to do, to, to do at least would be to, to actually do solo, uh, solo recordings and uh, transcribe them and give it to search. But uh, the point with this collection is that the, the uh, pieces here or the songs here are just uh, really chosen uh, manually by the, the institute. Uh, because they just want to publish the things that are copyright free and everything. So it's not really like this will be our collection and we'll put all the, I don't know, thousands of, 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 of songs in, but we will just choose these specific ones that are, you know, free of everything and just use this metadata. For example, there is no metadata of performance here because they didn't want to publish it and so forth. So this, this kinds of question. Uh, but in, the, in this interface that uh, we hope uh, some days we will do, then yeah, we, we plan to actually put much more uh, of this transcription techniques inside so that you can search over the audio. Mm. So, yeah. And also a question about, I saw this upload song uh, button thing there. Is that in use? Be, do, and do people uh, upload something? 
not as much as we would like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but it was the idea actually to, to have folk groups and, and uh, you know groups that perform music mm -hmm. actually upload their own material and then there is a sort of this curation stage where somebody can look at what has been uploaded and whether it's okay to, to publish it. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, not really much used actually. Cool. I mean, uh, for our folk music archive, we just uh, used a lot of manual hours for putting genre on things and, and getting uh, mm. uh, that kind of stuff right. It was very interesting to see your uh, attempts to do this automatically. Can you give me some feedback on, on how many genres you, you, you can actually automatically uh, classify with, uh, uh, with a good quality? You, you said it was 70% with 26 categories in this. Oh uh, yeah, the, the tune families you mean. Yeah, uh, yeah it, it really depends on, on what you... Um, uh, it's a very good question. For example, this was applied to the Dutch, Dutch yeah. uh, yeah. data set, which is sort of a public. Um, and uh, their data set, the, the tune families, at least uh, from my perspective, the, the melodies are really quite similar. So it, it's, it works fairly well. We applied it to, to the Slovenian collection where we also have manually annotated tune families. Yeah. Uh, but there the, the percentage is much lower. Because actually there the tune family definition goes more about lyrics yeah. and it's very lyrics based yeah. and not much about melody. So the melodies may be really widely different and even if you listen to them based on melody, we made this test and actually the algorithm had uh, the same performance as a human would. So yeah. you could say that this is good but it was not very good if we look at you know, the way things are labeled because they're labeled based on lyrics and not based on melody. Yeah. So for the Slovenian, let's say music, it's for the definition of tune families that they are having, if I can yeah. say so, it's not so good. But for so the Dutch, Alexander, it's okay. Alexander, okay, you as a Norwegian, how would this work on Norwegian folk music? Well, <laughs> it's I more music-based, isn't it? I should ask yeah. someone. Uh, or Rickard, maybe? Which? Oh, there's Hans. Ah. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> he did much of the work, so. <laughs> it might actually be very interesting to try this on, on songs. Yeah. On instrumental music, uh -huh. it's a great big mess because the tunes are multi-part and then they connect, combine different parts and then it's difficult to get the uh, tune families. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Can I just ask a question right away? Sure. Um, I was very interested in hearing how you dealt with uh, the pitch uh, shift, no, um, yeah. drifting, Drift, yeah. and then getting this together to to uh, synthesize one stanza. Yeah. But how do you deal with uh, pitches within a stanza or within a melody that's yeah. not drifting? Because Norwegian folk music research has been a lot about scales and intonation and uh yeah but uh, you mean uh, it changes between stanzas per on purpose uh because you enter a different scale and so forth is this uh, not or within a, within a stanza you mean or not between? necessarily that it it shifts but yeah. um it may have different pitches than a standard diatonic scale yeah um, I, the different pitches themselves wouldn't be such a big, big issue because the, um, okay, here we defined a sort of a, this is very standard a harmonic representation where at least for our purposes it's a 12 tone uh, thing, but you could, you could make it more microtonal and incorporate more and more variation inside and it, the same sort of approach would, would be valid. But of course in the, I guess in the instrumental context I would imagine that uh, different stanzas has lot, have lots of uh, sort of improvisation uh, so the melodies which are quite different and so this approach wouldn't really work for that because it tries to you know find the commonalities between all the stanzas and use this to, to get a, let's say single transcription which is good but for instrumental parts I think this would not fit so well yeah oh several questions there now let's start with there. Um, I have another question about the tune families which is that uh, once you had some categories, did they, was it unsupervised or semi? -supervised? This is yeah. Uh, actually, the part that generates the, the patterns is completely unsupervised. So uh, 
if we look, if we say that this is a sort of a hierarchy of, of patterns, this is completely unsupervised. But then when we had the classification into two families, we took this uh, as features and then we used the supervised, uh, of supervised method to, to, to classify. Um, and, and the kind of added question is whether the categories make sense to us. Is there anything there that kind of... Yeah, I mean, they do. In this collection that, that uh, actually was used here, I mean, they, they make sense even if you listen to them as, as melodies. They sort of have these commonalities that you find them. Uh, they make sense, yeah. So, this is why I guess we also got some results which, which make sense. I mean, which let's say are good. Or, I mean, people get up to 90% with this collection if they really tune their algorithms to, to, to capture the families. Is one more question about the, um, the the standardization of the stanzas, and and I wonder because to some extent that would be the the task of the the old musicologists uh, when they heard all these different things and they should decide how to, which one should they notate. Yeah. But but then. Uh, the musicologists listening to the different versions and variabilities, maybe they would uh, distinguish between mistakes and accepted variability or, or traditional or, or and, and, and to some and that has also been a discussion in, in Norwegian folk music, the, the, the standardizing effect of, uh, of notation mm. and if this standardization is made automatically with this standardization effect become even stronger or or uh, where, where in fact my question was do you have any uh, try to compare the automatic averaging with a musicologist trying to to do the same thing yeah actually not not systematically but it's actually when we when we had this technique uh, the way that we measured success by, was by comparing to what the musicologists annotated yeah so uh, it we did this comparison, but uh, let's say the, uh, the accuracy of the algorithm is still only around 70%, so it's hard to discuss, you know, this small, I can say small effects like standardization where you would, you know, decide for a given pitch whether it was on purposely sung like that or it was just a mistake. So um, um, the, the, the accuracy is not so good that we would really be able to say whether, you know, uh, how much this will, will would, if it was perfect, how much it would actually uh, affect or be different to what the musicologists do. So I don't have an answer to that, but it's sure it's, it is certainly is relevant. I mean, we have thought about this a lot, about what, a, what an average stance actually means, but, you know, because we are doing some sort of averaging of all the repetitions. Uh, but yeah, we don't have a clear, clear answer to, to, to that. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, in the beginning, you had this uh, separation between speech uh, and uh, music of different kinds, and I can envisage different uh, algorithms to do that. Uh, one has been MFCC, yeah. the call, but what, what did you use here? Uh, yeah, we used actually, so this was uh, done before deep learning. <laughs> so yeah, we, we used, uh, MFCCs was one of the features that we used. We actually use very few features. We, I think we have altogether around 10 different features that we calculate, some MFCCs and some other things, some that are typical for speech, like, I don't know, 4 hertz modulation, or th there are some of the features that are specific to, let's say, speech versus music. Uh, some are more timbre related. So different types, I think, have actually very few features and a very simple classifier, which is logistic regression, and it works quite well. Um, uh, overall, so, but yeah, we are now actually in the process of <coughs> also trying to go deep and have a larger collection that we will annotate and, and, and because I'm sure we will be better than we are now. Uh, we have a database which you can test. Uh, yeah, great, yeah, I, I, I would like to. You actually. already did. Yeah. <laughs> you want <a> radio program, <laughs> program during your speech and run this room and test. <laughs> yeah, good, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, Cool, so we have some collaboration going on already. That's <laughs> nice. yeah. Okay, I think we'll end there. Um, thanks again to Mattia for, for coming and for presenting. Thanks.
thank you all for coming and thanks to the National Library and Rikard for hosting us. And uh, again, this is just the beginning. So see you again soon. We will um, we also have the next Sound Tracer workshop it will be on the 4th of May here. And then we will, uh, Olivier will present version 1.0 of the Sound Tracer. And uh, we will also have uh, Maynard Müller, a professor from Germany, uh, to also come to be an international guest at that uh, event. Um, so stay tuned.